Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. Today, I have a special guest, and we are going to talk about how to take care of yourself while parenting. We're going to dive into how to care for yourself while you're parenthooding, and how to take care of yourself is really important for your kids, and how you don't have to choose between being a pushover or a tyrant. So welcome again to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. My name is Nicole Simonin, and I am your host, and I help women over 40 lose weight for the last time. Over the past 20 years, I have developed a weight loss program where there are no pills, there's no potion, there's no diets to follow, no insane workouts, no massive cardio. With my background as a professional ballet dancer and teacher, a medical degree in physical therapy, personal trainer, and health coach, I have really boiled down weight loss to doing three things fueling your body, moving your body, and managing your mind. I teach my clients simple and doable ways to lose weight. And as a client, you are going to learn how to eat whatever you want and still lose weight. You will also get a customized workout program designed just for you that fits into your schedule, not the other way around. And we are also going to figure out what is really holding you back from losing that weight. Imagine a year from now and you're down 40 pounds. And you don't have to worry about your weight anymore because you will know exactly how to keep it off for good, no matter what life throws at you. So if you are like, hell yeah, I want that, then schedule your discovery call today. Go to shapeitupfitness.com slash call and get the body you really want to be living in. All right, so let's dive into today's topic. And my special guest today has been working as a parent coach for over 10 years, has raised four kids of her own. She has her own parental dreams and nightmares that she has experienced through every childhood stage. She takes a holistic approach to parent work, which includes emotional support, home management skills, and effective discipline that empowers children while improving their behavior. So welcome, Anne Kaplan, to the show. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for having me. No problem. And I am so thrilled that you're coming on today because I know that my listeners are parents, I myself have two kids. Now, granted, they're teenagers, so they're almost fully cooked, as I like to say, (laughs) ready to leave the nest soon. But um, I know it was a struggle growing. You know, I started my business in 2006 and was parenting these two kids that I had no clue what to do with. So uh, I'm glad you're here and um, we're going to share some of your wisdom. Yeah. Well, I think I belong here, too, because I'm working on shaping myself up over 40 myself. (laughs) 42 and resonate a lot with some of the stuff that you are talking about. And I do think that there's a big dovetail for a lot of people our age that um, that overlap between that parenting and the realities of parenting life and all the things that we're trying to do to keep ourselves healthy and um, take care of ourselves. And sometimes it feels like those things are um, in war with each other, but they don't have to be. So hopefully what we're going to talk about today will be helpful for everybody. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. I think a lot of it's expectations. Like we just have so many expectations on how to be a parent, how to look a certain way, how to be the wife, how to be the, the mom, the, the you as a human, which sometimes gets pushed down as you're taking care of kids. Cause you don't, I know for me, um, I kind of lost sight of myself as the kids were getting older. And I kind of didn't really, I kind of lost me, you know, lost independently. But um, so tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got started as a parent coach. Yeah. So like you said, I've got four of my own kids. So I have been living the dream and nightmare, like you said, of (laughs) motherhood for 17 years. My oldest kiddo is 17. My youngest is seven. Um, and, uh, before I was doing parent work, I was doing um, birth work. And as my clients, kids grew, and as my kids grew, I started fielding more and more questions about kind of what to do with these kids, not just how to get them out of our bodies, but then what to do with them after the fact. And it was just kind of was like a natural organic progression, not just of the work that I was doing, but the sort of mission that I had in the work that I was doing. So when I was a doula and also as a parent coach, there's a real driving force for me behind my work, which is helping people parent on their own terms, maybe breaking away from either generational cycles or um, messages that they've absorbed from the world around them, like really finding our way to being ourselves in parenthood and 
kind of parenting on purpose, I like to say, instead of just kind of falling into default patterns that we kind of soak up from everything around us. So um, it was a pretty organic growth for me to transition into not just helping people apply those principles to their births, but also to their parenting. Yeah. Um, and I now, love, oh, go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I love that you brought up the generational um, aspect of it. Cause I know for me personally, I've um, been thinking a lot about that in the weight loss realm in the sense of like, people grow up thinking that, you know, you have to be on a diet or you have to do certain things. And um, it's the same thing with parenting, you know, whatever we were taught with and some of those stuff that, that it doesn't serve us, you know, and it doesn't help us become the person that we want to be. And then you're passing it on to kids. It's like, let's, let's cut the, let's stop. Yeah, <laughs> let's stop 100%. telling our kids that we have to starve ourselves in order to look a certain way. Yeah. I, I mean, I just couldn't agree more with pretty much everything that you just said. Like I talk a lot about how like conventional wisdom, the kind of things that we just have inherited from th that, all that messaging that we've gotten, you know, be, something being conventional, it's not a compliment. Like conventionalism is not actually helping us, whether we're talking about it in terms of our health or the way that we parent these ideas that we have to like um, from a, from a, uh, health standpoint that we have to like deny ourselves things and put ourselves on this starvation thing. And certain things are good and certain things are bad. And I mean, talk about modeling for our kids, really mm. disordered eating and disordered, like self image and things like that. It is really problematic. And the same thing with parenting, right? Like all these messages that we absorbed about like how, for example, like a mother should really just like sacrifice herself in every way for her family, or that if your kids aren't doing well, it's your fault, or that you have the power or the duty to fix your kids' problems or, you know, make them happy and, and things mm. like that. Um, and all of those sort of messages wind up creating toxicity in so many ways, toxic modeling of self-care and, um, and then also just like literally toxic behaviors with our children that, that aren't helpful. We wind up, you know, really getting caught in power struggles with them and things like that, because we have this idea of like, it's supposed to be this way. And it's my job to make it that way. And you are standing between me and being a good mother. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I know my kids, um, my daughter, I love her dearly. She's my youngest and she is very headstrong, very independent, been told very much like her mother. And she, um, it's just interesting. Cause like, like she has a messy room. Right. And I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like within reason, like I don't want food in there. Cause I don't want mice or right. ants and bugs and stuff like that. But like, she gets to be who she wants to be. And, and I, I find you know, growing up, I don't know how you were, but like our room was expected to be clean mm -hmm. and everybody has those different expectations on it. Right. I, I think don't know that's if it's that important. Like a really great example of just something that's in a lot of ways could be considered revolutionary. Like you decided for yourself as a mom, like, what are the things that I actually care about? What are the things that are going to actually be rules in my house instead of just deciding like, well, in general, this is what I'm supposed to do as a parent. So I guess I guess we have this rule that I actually don't care about. And now I have to enforce, like, instead yeah. you get to decide, like, actually, you know, in our house, that's not a rule and that's totally fine. And I think also, you know, there's a big overlap in this, in parenting around exactly the stuff that you're teaching. Like, it's not just like taking care of yourself in this new way. If you're trying to lose weight or get healthier is going to be more effective for you and get you the results you want faster, but also it is literally an extension of your parenting because as parents we know the most important thing we do for our children is modeling behavior so mm -hmm. even like a parent who's working with you whether or not they're even thinking about their parenting like learning the things that they're learning from you and implementing those things is actually changing the way that they're parenting because it's changing the way that they're modeling a relationship with food and body yeah. to their children yeah I have um, a lot of parents have actually asked me, but one in particular, not too long ago, she was like, I don't know how to get to my daughter to like, tell her she needs to do something about her weight. And I was like, knowing both of these people, um, the mother is overweight and the daughter is overweight. And I'm like, I said, you're not going to like my answer. I said, you need to be the model. Mm -hmm. You need to be the one that changed. You can't tell. We all know kids don't listen to a word we say. 
they only follow <laughs> what we're doing. If you tell them don't be a smoker and you're smoking cigarettes, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. That's definitely true. And I think also, especially for kids who were struggling with their own health or weight, there's an emotional component that we may or may not be addressing well. And that is another example of where we need to kind of look at ourselves a little bit, because like, what is our relationship with food? What is our relationship with our bodies? Are we being hypocritical and expecting our children to see themselves, their health, their bodies in this really well enlightened and well-rounded way while we are actually modeling something very different for them in the way that we think about ourselves. Yeah. I, people are shocked when um, I talk about like what my kids eat because now granted my, I have to throw my husband under the bus here a little bit, but he brings home the crappy food, <laughs> like the unhealthy food. Um, if you want to call it that, but you know, and they probably wouldn't been exposed to a lot of different things growing up if I had been the only one shopping. But um, I allow my kids because of what I do, like as a personal trainer, even from being a professional ballet dancer, I never wanted them to like not have these like desserts and things because when they go over to a friend's house, they're going to like binge and overeat and hide things and all that. And so I think people are really shocked when they're like, oh, your kids are allowed to eat Oreos. Yeah, they're allowed to eat Oreos, you know? Yeah, well, and I also think like something that I think a lot of us don't really think about that much when our kids are younger, but is true is that even when you start to have rules around food and restrictions around food with your kids, one of the things that you are also doing is giving messages about body autonomy that mm -hmm. can wind up becoming insidious in ways that we never expected once they become older. It's really hard to tell kids out of one side of our mouths, you're the boss of your body. You get to decide who touches you or what you do with other people. And people can't do things to your body without your permission. And let's talk about consent. And then out of the other side of our mouths, we're saying, eat your food. You have to put this in your mouth. You have to eat this. Mm. I'm the boss of your body right now. Interesting. Yeah very conflicting messaging. And so as you say, which is very, very common outcome, Nicole, is when people start putting no, you know, no sugar at all. We don't have any of this like garbage food in our home. What happens is kids do often tend to start hoarding food, hiding food, um, lying about food. Food becomes a place where they can have control, mm. which as we all know, can sometimes lead to eating disorders. Like once you create a battleground around food with your child, you are setting up so many um, sort of like breeding grounds for disordered everything in the future, whether it's disordered body behavior, disordered relationships with food, power struggles around food, it, and disordered relationship with a parent, like all mm. of those things, and having a much more healthy and just kind of like natural consequences approach to food is a much better way to basically set the stage for kids to learn lessons around food through their own experiences and develop their own relationship with food in their bodies from their own experiences instead of from somebody kind of wagging a finger at them and saying, now this is what you need to do and think and be and look like. Yeah. Oh, I love all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think again, I think that comes back to the generational, like we were taught that you were taught, you know, this is what you do. And this is, and that's it. Yeah. I, I have a distinct memory when I was four years old of my dad coming home from work and grabbing a cookie out of the cookie jar. And I said, well, I want to have a cookie before dinner. And my dad said, you can't have a cookie, but when you're the dad, you get to have a cookie. And I <laughs> I'm never going to be a dad. I'm going to be a mom. And he said, okay, fine. When you're a mom, you can have the cookie. For dinner. And I said, no, when I'm a mom, I'll have to be on a diet. Oh, wow. Four years old, yeah. watching my mom, like weigh her stuff and set up deals with my dad about if she lost 20 pounds, he would buy her a mink coat. And oh, wow. Yeah. That like, it's, pretty gross the stuff that we most of us like I know because I work with parents all day long like my stories are not unique mm. in fact they are the tip of the iceberg compared to what other people have experienced about their bodies and the, their beauty and food growing up and so like we as parents are doing something 
very important because we get to decide if we want to be the end of this cycle, mm. generational dysfunction. And it's hard work. It means that we have to heal ourselves to get back to the whole, what we talked about in the beginning about ta how taking care of ourselves is actually something we do for our children, right. not selfish. In order to teach our kids different lessons, we have to actually believe those lessons. Mm. And that means we have to do the hard work of changing the way we think and the stories we tell ourselves about our bodies and about food and, and all of those things. We can't just hope our kids don't see the world we do, we, the, see the world the way we do. We need to actually change the way we see the world. Yeah. And I think, I know in my case, and I'm sure you have clients that are like this, but they, clients come to me and they don't realize the stories that are in their heads. Like, it's just like this background hum of like, this is how you operate. And if you're not aware of, this is why hiring a coach is so vital. Like, right. It's I, not about like, just do this instead. Like if it were that easy, everyone would be yeah. parenting perfectly or eating perfectly or whatever. Like right. anybody can read a book about parenting or read a book about nutrition. And guess what? You will change 0% what you're doing right now and how you're talking to your children or how you're feeding yourself or whatever, because it's the psychological element that is missed when you're trying to figure this stuff out on your own, you don't have a person there to hold you accountable and kind of hold a mirror up to you so you can start to question the way that you are approaching problems and the stories you're telling yourself and begin over time to rewire your brain, literally to see the world differently. That's not something that you can do in a vacuum. You need help. Yeah, yeah. especially when that same voice that's coming through, you just think it's truth. For sure. 100%. Yeah. It doesn't feel, doesn't feel like just a, a spin on things. It feels like the factual truth with a capital T. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So talk a little bit more um, about how like doing this is for your kids and how really caring for yourself as you're parenting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's obviously in, in your realm, in this context, often taking care of yourself can be talking about like your physical health, your nutrition, um, to caring for your body. And that's one example, of course, but there's a million other examples, like the self-talk that we have about whether or not we deserve to just do things that bring us joy as parents, mm -hmm. or um, even your example about not setting up a strict rule about keeping your bedroom clean or something like that's a way that you chose to take care of yourself in the sense that you decided like, I'm not going to set myself up to have this extra stress and anxiety and pressure and responsibility in my life. I get to decide for myself, how can I set my family up in a way that takes care of me? Um, anything from having a regular date night or regular, just like I am neither parenting nor working right now time every week. Mm. Like all of those things are about taking care of ourselves. But I also think like this work that we're talking about of like changing our brains and changing our stories is about taking care of ourselves. I don't know about you. And one of the reasons why I love how your business focuses on people who are more 40 and in midlife, but something happens to happen to me, and I have observed this in most of my uh, clients who aren't like in their early beginning chapters of motherhood, but are further along in their work. You know, most of us, especially high achieving women in general, have gotten to where we've gotten largely through self-flagellation, mm -hmm. like go to the gym or you're a loser or lazy. You know, if you eat that cupcake, you'll only have yourself to blame. You know, it's this, like, you need to do this or else you're bad. Or, you know, if you do that, you're a bad person or whatever. And we're really like beating ourselves up and, and having almost like an abusive relationship with ourselves in order to achieve. But what I've observed in my, I, I hate to say older patients, like we're not old. I'm 42 and I am not old. That is, uh, okay. But on the spectrum of motherhood, let's say, like we talk, when I talk to my clients who are like, I would say maybe like 35 or older, I think most of us guess, get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life. Like, why do we get stuck? Like one of the biggest reasons, like I, I work with my clients a lot where they're like, okay, I'm trying to do the stuff that I'm learning from you, but I'm not doing it. Why am I not actually doing this stuff? That I just paid you a ton of money to do. 
And almost always the reason why is something like this. Basically, you have established with yourself all throughout your life that doing something new or achieving something new comes at a cost. And the cost is the meanness that you have to experience through your negative self-talk to get you to achieve. And now here you are, 35 years old, 45 years old, whatever, and you've decided that you want to do this new thing in your parenting, or in your case, Nicole, like you want to do this new thing in your um, nutrition. But your brain already believes that to do something new and be successful at it means that you have to just be really mean to yourself and feel really bad about yourself the whole time. And I think for a lot of us, once we get to this chapter of our lives, there's a maybe even a subconscious aspect to our brains that is just like, forget it. It's not even worth it. If achieving this goal means that I have to feel like crap, I'd rather just stagnate and not even try because at least I don't have to be mean to myself and say all this, you know, negative stuff. Yeah. So, you know, like rewiring our brains to just literally take care of ourselves in the way that we see ourselves achieve things, approach things, like try things. Um, it is such a gift. It's such a gift for ourselves, obviously, because now we get to not only achieve a great goal and get this great outcome, but do so in a way that isn't toxic. But also it is absolutely 100% for our children. First of all, because of that modeling that we were already talking about, but also because now they get to have a parent who is like happy, healthy, mm thriving, energized, vibrant, like their childhood is literally flavored by our energy. And as our energy shifts, we're completely changing the whatever energetic cocktail that our kids are swimming in for 18 years straight. Yeah. I, I agree with that in the sense of like, you know, when you're around somebody who's miserable and like kind of on edge, I guess is the best way to put it. Cause I, I know that was for me when I first started my business, I was a little on edge because I didn't know exactly what to do. I'm, you know, running this health and fitness business and my kids are involved because they're little and they're not in school. And, you know, I, I do think there's another part, what you were saying about to um, how, like, anytime we try to do something new, we, we feel like we have to beat ourselves up in order to get that. And I do think there's this like, societal like badge of honor like if you're not mm -hmm. you know beating yourself down like as far as weight loss if you're not beating yourself down in the gym you're not sacrificing and this like whole I don't eat that stuff whatever sugar flour whatever your thing is you know there's like this badge of honor like you're I, I don't know it's, it's like it's almost assumed right. that you have to go through that in order to succeed when I think this is exactly what we're talking about in terms of breaking generational cycles, like it's almost impossible for us to imagine what it might be like to have grown up, like instead of having to unlearn this stuff when we're 45, what if we just never learned it in the first place? And that's yeah. the opportunity we have to give our kids right now, like by unlearning it ourselves and then modeling that, reflecting that for our children, using that as our approach in our parenting, we're actually saving our kids from first of all, learning a bunch of garbage and then having to unlearn it. They just right. instead get to grow up in a place where like, that's just not their truth. I had a, uh, uh, interaction with my daughter a few years ago where, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, like not all of our mothers-in-law or mothers or whatever agree with our parenting <laughs> style. Right. That's pretty common. Yeah. Um, so Especially when you're trying to break through yeah, something exactly. different. Yeah. <laughs> be different so it's almost guaranteed that someone's going to be like ah oh, that's not how you do it no that's not right um, so one time a, a, a several years ago my husband and I went on a trip and my mother-in-law stayed with our kids and my daughter Gigi is very similar to what you described like she's not super organized when it comes to like pick, picking up after herself and things like that she's a lot better now she's older but when she was um uh, this was like when she was like kind of like maybe like nine or so and she was just a hot mess as far as like keeping track of her stuff and putting it away and stuff and my mother-in-law came up with this great strategy which was to put a rubber band around her wrist and make her snap it every time that she left something out and didn't clean up after herself and when I found out about this, I'm like in Mexico, like, that's it. We're going home tomorrow. Our kids are not safe. <laughs> right? <laughs> my husband talked me down, but um, obviously my mama bear instincts were like totally just triggered 
partly because this person had chosen to completely disrespect my parenting philosophy, knowing that that's not how we raise our kids. And then also the thing that she was doing to disrespect my parenting philosophy, I strongly disagreed with. But I will tell you that I came home from that trip and I decided I was going to talk to Gigi about it. And I was like, you know, well, that was kind of strange when Bubby did that. Like, what, do you, what did you think about it? And she goes, I just thought it was really weird because you don't have to hurt yourself just because you make a mistake. That was so dumb. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, exactly. <laughs> you know, like it's working. Right, right. <laughs> such this great like lesson learned moment for me of like, first of all, the parenting I'm doing is getting through to my kids. Also, just because somebody else parents differently than me or tries to, nothing can undermine the sanctity and and solidity of how I have parented my children. Not only that, but those those incongruous moments where someone's trying to tell my kids something that doesn't compute to them Mm -hmm. wind up just being moments where we can even underscore even more the lessons that we're teaching to our kids and, and, um, and uh, strengthen even more these um, kind of worldviews and stuff like that. And uh, it was like one of those moments where you realize like, Oh my God, like she just sees the world. Her world is different than mine. I I did it. You know, (laughs) In her world, you don't punish yourself when you make a mistake. Yeah. I wish I lived in that world. I'm trying so hard to live in that world. <laughs> yeah, I think we can learn a lot from kids in that sense. Um, yeah, I, I just, as a, as a parent, and again, we'll have to see. My kids are almost 17 and almost 15. So as they get older, I'll see if it worked on at least mine. But I love giving them, I want to say the power to like understand how other people operate almost to an extent, but also be really secure in who they are and what they think. And Mm -hmm. whatever that may be, they may agree with me on a, on a subject or they may not. And that's okay. Like, I just love that again, because my kids are older, like they're, they're growing into these adults and it's like having these adult conversations with them and kind of understanding, oh, that's really cool. The way you think about that and like being open to that aspect. Well, and I think honestly, the chapter of parenthood that you're in right now, which I am in also, I also have a 17 year old and a 15 year old, um, this chapter that we're in, I think, well, first of all, it is not picturesque. It is hard parenting teenagers, but there is something so redemptive and exciting about the opportunity we have in our relationship with our teenagers that is totally different than the dynamic we have when they're younger. Um, and so even though, like you said, they're mostly cooked, uh, (laughs) but, um, but this also is just such a pivotal moment for them of like, kind of, um, almost like tying the relationship you've created with them into a little neat little bow before they leave the nest of, these last years are their like lasting memories and moments that kind of bring it kind of congeals everything that we've been doing for the last like 18 years all into some really strong solid fully formed relationship yeah 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 it's very very sacred yeah I have to say I never thought I would enjoy the teen years (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I feel like I know people um, like for when COVID hit, it was kind of a blessing in that sense, in the sense that they couldn't go out. So we kind of missed that, that year of, of going out to parties. And now of course we're getting into that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how, um, how they've evolved and, you know, and I loved every age that they went through you know, of course there's always, you know, the, the nightmare parts too, but, um, and I'm sure that will continue as they go into college as well, but, <laughs> mm-hmm. but yeah. yeah. Awesome. So can you touch on a little bit between choosing that you don't have to be a pushover or a tyrant? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, this might seem like a little bit of a, I don't know, pivot in the, our topic, but it, but from my perspective, it isn't. Um, I think this idea of you either are a doormat or you're like this bully disciplinarian is something that also was inherited through generational paradigms and things like that. So I I find it really fits with what we've been talking about. Um, And then also, I think it's kind of how we, it's an extension of how we treat ourselves for sure. Like 
do you try to get yourself to do stuff by being a tyrant with yourself? Mm. Do you try to um, make yourself feel better by just completely caving and not respecting any of your own boundaries? Like we show up the way we show up, whether we're talking about in relation to ourselves, in relation to the people we love, it's very, very similar for sure. But this is kind of one of the biggest things that I work so hard in my practice to help people realize is this is a false choice. And I have a feeling that it's very similar to the work that you do with your clients about nutrition. Like you don't have to choose between being like a total, you know, whatever, having no willpower and, and yeah. like caving all the time, or just like being so rigidly dogmatic with yourself that you feel like you're, you know, and being punished all the time, approaching food, approaching ourselves that way is never going to work for anybody. And so it's really getting to the place where you can actually disbelieve that that's your, the choice you have to make. Like, this is just such nonsense because both of those approaches are ineffective. Being a pushover with your kids is not an effective way. You want it being way too permissive. You don't have any leadership in your relationship and your kids are going to have a million friends in their lives. They only get one parent or two parents mm -hmm. and you are really um, sort of missing the boat if you just choose not to take advantage of this singular relationship that you have with your child that they'll never have with anybody else. Right. And then also being tyrannical with our kids doesn't work because kids don't just need boundaries and leadership. They need closeness and relationship and emotional health. So the choice that we really have to make as parents, if we want to be um, doing a truly effective job is a role with our children where we have a high level of leadership and a high level of closeness and connection with our children where we are kind and compassionate and empathetic to them while we still hold them accountable for their actions. And so the way that I teach my clients to um, uh, parent is using a relationship-based, compassionate and accountable approach to behavior and discipline. So for example, like it might be in your house that the rule is you know, if you don't have your homework done by the end of the week, you don't get screens for the weekend. Well, that is a perfectly legitimate boundary to set. That's the way that this child's life is set up. And you can feel a hundred million percent sorry for them that they don't get screens this weekend because that does suck. And you can say like, I'm really sorry that you're in this position. I would be really unhappy too, if I were you. And I'm, I bet that you're going to make a better choice next week. I know you can do it. This is awesome. And 0% of the time, are you saying anything about changing the rule or quote unquote, rescuing your mm -hmm, kid? Yeah. Um, and I think we also can approach our own wellness in that way of like, I'm really, really sorry that you have such a terrible stomach ache right now. <laughs> I would have a stomach ache too, if I ate an entire chocolate cake. <laughs> That really sucks. Instead of like, what is the matter with you? You idiot. Why did you eat that cake? You're such a piece of crap. Yeah. Right? It yeah. doesn't have to be that way. Like just being compassionate for not only the fact that you ate the cake, but maybe the emotional place you were in before, during, and after you ate the cake. And yeah. I, I think as women, we tend to go one extreme or the other extreme, you know? And again, I think that's one of those generational things where I think somewhere along the line, somebody thought that was a great idea. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but it, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, you're either on a quote unquote diet or you're not. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't like diets at all. But like, and I also find too, I know you mentioned nutrition a couple of times, like the people listening, your people as well. And they're not, you're not stupid. We know right. that an apple is better for us than an Oreo. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean you can't have the Oreo, but we know, we know you don't need to go down that rabbit hole of like, what are my macros? What are my calories? All that stuff. Right. Um, and I think that's, again, where we're like, we're either all in or all out. Well, and I think that's, I mean, a total parallel to my work. You know, most of the work I do isn't actually educating people that, you know, it's not good to yell at your kid. Like, uh, duh, we all know that. <laughs> Um, we, we're not stupid. Like most of the people who come to work with me come to me because they know that they're pairing in parenting in ways that aren't quote unquote, right. According to their own value system, yeah. but they just can't figure out how to do it differently. And I would say of those people, 
probably most of them already know what to do differently. They just don't understand why they're not doing it differently. Like, you don't probably need me to tell you like, oh, natural consequence consequences, you know, de delivered with love and compassion. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. You already yeah. knew that. You already watched Full House once, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it really but, is that whole mindset piece of like everything. I, I really feel like, again, I, if everybody, I know people who are listening on my end, you know, my story, I started off doing the fitness and nutrition in the sense of like, I did the meal plans for everybody. I did the hard workouts. We did boot camps. We did all that stuff. And yeah, they got the, the weight loss, but they haven't kept it off. And then adding that mindset piece in, and I'm sure it's the same for your um, business in the sense, like once you understand the way you operate and the way your mind works, the way, you know, we're talking about generational way that was formed and why it, it's so much, it just clicks into place. It's just so much. There's so many parallels there. between our two practices. I'd say the same thing. People heard my spiel a million times of like, when I started my practice, all I did was teach parenting skills. I'm a love and logic independent facilitator. I was like, this is great. I know all the right ways to parent. I would just teach everybody love and logic. And then all of the families in the world would be better. And I will have healed the world. One family <laughs> done and done. And like, like literally like one month into my practice, I was like, this is not working. <laughs> like meet with my clients and be like, how did it go with the, you know, boundaries with choice? Oh, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> right. Why? Well, let me explain to you again, why you should do it. Well, she already knows why she <laughs> do it. Like yeah. until I decided to work in the mindset stuff to my practice, I was just taking people's money. You know, it just doesn't work. You have to have that emotional piece. And the other thing, just in terms of like health, I mean, I can share my own story. Like I am not fat and I am not old, but I found out this year that I am pre-diabetic mm -hmm. and, um, and I need to get my health back on track or, you know, I have a whole, like half my life is still waiting for me. And I'm already in a place where like my body's not functioning properly. And part of that is my nutrition. Part of that is also my stress level. And like, anyone I'm, I'm i'm preaching to the choir to say this to you nicole but like cortisol has a massive correlation with the way that our bodies process sugar our insulin function our weight yeah. all of that stuff and for me personally one of the best things i can do to manage my stress you know like if you want to really attack this problem from all aspects it's not just about like don't be way less and then you won't be pre-diabetic i'm already not fat <laughs> yeah. um but also take care of yourself sitting around in your own, a prison of your own mind, because it is a torture chamber that you've devised for yourself is not going to help your body work better. It's not going to help you lose weight. And, you know, just even like for most of us at this age, once we're over 40, like we've already tried all the diets, we've already tried all of the, and, or for parenting, we've already tried like three, two, one magic or, you know, whatever the crap. Okay. Like, why not just give yourself like it's worth a shot to try something different like what about if you just don't hate yourself for a while yeah what let's just see what happens like hating yourself has gotten you this far okay that's the results of that experiment are in now let's <laughs> run a different experiment and just like see you know yeah yeah chance i think you um you definitely hit it on the head in the sense of like you know when people come to me they're all like oh, i want to look like this Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but there's more to it than that. You don't want to just look like that. And, you know, people that do come um, because they have diagnosis, you know, now it's like, okay, now they're lack of a better term, their asses to the fire, you know, like it, it's time to get real. Well, it's say something <laughs> even more crass. So you're good. I don't know if I have to put an E on this episode. I, now, know. <laughs> I tried so hard not to swear this whole time. It's okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, why, you know, it's like, and, and it's, I think it's harder for people who are not overweight and they're not, you know, they're in that in between and they get diagnosed with prediabetes because you're like, but wait a minute, I'm not a hundred pounds overweight. Why, why is this happening? Right. And it does come down to like, how, how do you want to take care of this vessel that you live in? How do you want to take care of that person? And that totally ties into, you know, not just physically, but mentally and how you show up as a parent, how you show up as you, who, who's a person that you want to be living in this world, you know? Yeah. So totally. So, and um, you have something for the audience. Would you like to share? 
So if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about me and how I work and maybe even start changing the behavior and your relationship with your kiddo right away, um, I think the best place to start is to get my free workbook. It's called Getting Kids to Listen the First Time. And it's super easy to find online. So even if you're listening to this while you're driving, you can still remember the URL. It's a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash kids who listen. And um, if you get that, well, first of all, it will make a big difference in how you're parenting right away. Also, you'll get to be on my email list, which means that you'll get emails from me about once a week that just have really killer parenting tips and support and encouragement. And you'll find out about all of my workshops and things like that, that I offer throughout the year. So it's the perfect way to just get in and get all the info right away. Awesome. And if you didn't get that link, I will for sure have it in the show notes so you can get it there as well. All right. So let's do our little speed round or lightning round of questions. Did you forget that? (laughs) I'm scared. (laughs) I'll make it real easy for the first one. Cat or dog? Dog, because I'm allergic to cats. Me too. Mm-hmm. I'm allergic to cats. I, we have um, like a post and beam home. Um, it's a Yankee barn home and there's a lot of wood. So I could not imagine a cat like in here. They would be like up in the rafters. <laughs> I mean, I kind of wish I weren't allergic to cats because they seem like way more like low maintenance. And I don't know if anyone's heard my dog barking up spread throughout <laughs> this interview. Like they're quiet. They can go to the bathroom by themselves. Like there's a lot to be said for cats. I just can't. My dog, I have to share, she is a Havanese, so she's small, and we have her pee pad trained. Oh, that's kind of cool. So it's kind of like the cat, I mean, you know, it's not like there's a litter box in there, but it's like she does her thing and clean up yeah. and then it's done. I don't have to take her out in the cold. I don't have to take her out in the rain. So cool. It's an apartment dog, we like to say. Oh. <laughs> Can't do that so much with big dogs, though. If you're a big dog person, that's a little more challenging. All right. So... What movie would you never get tired of watching? I'm going to sound like such a loser. (laughs) No negative (laughs) (laughs) self-talk. It's just because, especially this last year, everyone's been talking about like how problematic it is, but my like instant knee jerk answer to that question is love actually. Okay. Not a romantic comedy. It's like a rom-com yeah. from about Christmas. Like I love Christmas. I love, I just love distracting, like escapist. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how I enjoy my media. It's like, I'm, that's the whole point I'm, of I'm, movies. <laughs> I know. I'm watching Emily in Paris right now, which is complete trash, but I'm just like, <laughs> it's great. Everyone's pretty. I like their clothes. I can understand some of the French. Like. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh. The last the last movie we watched, I think, was Venom Two, which if oh, you wow. haven't watched, uh, we're a superhero type, but I love yeah. Venom. Venom, I thought was hysterical. Yeah, I had very oh, low I- expectations for that movie when I went in, so I don't know if that was part of it, but I loved. <laughs> I thought it was hysterical. Check that one out. I am not sure if we watched it yet. Yeah. All right, the last question. Let's see. Oh my god! Mm-hmm. Like you you could like imagine everyone's listening. Imagine Nicole like drumming her fingers. <laughs> yeah, evilly, right? <laughs> on her face. <laughs> All right. Well, we're talking about superheroes, so we'll go with that one. If you could pick a superpower, power, what would it be? You know what? I used to hands down, like immediately be like being invisible because I dying to know what everybody else thinks about me and what people say when I'm not around and stuff like that. And that still is, that's still in me. That's part of me too, but I care a lot less than I did before. So I don't know if invisibility, honestly, after standing in for three hours in traffic, trying to get my kids to the ski mountain this weekend, flying, that is my answer. <laughs> grab the kids and go right (laughs) yep yeah yeah I think flying would be pretty cool that would yep that's it hands down I don't know we don't have to go to the airport ever you just like go I have this fantasy that one of my kids someday will get their like pilot's license and then we'll just be like have your own private jet (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know if I'd want to be invisible listening to other people's thoughts on me yeah, I, no, now I'm a fully grown human woman with a good head on my shoulders. 
the worst gift you could possibly ever have. But when I was in my twenties and I was just like so desperate to be good enough, I mm. really would love that. That would be very interesting for mindset work for sure. You would open a whole can of worms there. You <laughs> yeah, Nicole, you see that in your coaching sessions and asking what your client's superpower should be and, and why. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> All right. So let's wrap up one tip that you want to leave the listeners with. Mm, Oh my gosh. It's so hard. Okay. This is my like sound bite of my approach to parenting, or at least not all parent, all parenting, but the discipline side of parenting is to handle every problem, every parenting or behavioral problem with one sentence and one action. That's it. So most of our, us are making the biggest mistake we're making is talking way too much, like explaining things to kids, trying to convince them, repeating ourselves, which is why I made that workbook of getting kids to listen the first time. Like so much less talking is my advice for you. And instead of talking, take action, whether it's going and taking your kid's phone away from them or leaving the room because someone's being disrespectful or, you know, just saying no and walking away. Like that's one sentence and one action. (laughs) Most of us are doing a lot of like verbal discipline, which doesn't work. And it's also very passive. Even if you're yelling and screaming, it's still a passive way of just hoping that you can do something and then things will magically change. Like get into an active role in your discipline. Physically moving your body is a good rule of thumb. Yeah, I love that. Go walk on the treadmill and or go for a nature walk and blow off some steam. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I just mean physically moving your body into out of the situation. Actually, physically (laughs) doing something about your (laughs) right, right, right. I think that is a great tip. All right, everybody. Um, we are gonna wrap up. So Anne, thank you so much for being on the call today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. All right, everyone. I hope you dive into Anne's gifts and all the tips that she gave you and the gems. And I will talk to you all next week. Have a wonderful week.